some time ago, quite a while ago, I did a series on change. So instead of calling it change or whatever I called it, and that's quite a while ago, we're calling this supernatural change. Change, we are studying in our um, Bible study book, it's called A Prosperous Soul. We keep, we hear the scripture, I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That requires change, but it requires supernatural change. You know, we read the scripture, John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, which we know he steals the word, according to Mark chapter 4. To steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That abundant life is down here in the earth. Amen. Are we experiencing abundant life? Then it says that Jesus came and whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life or the God kind of life. And that's living the God kind of life here in the earth. So what we need is supernatural change. God has promised believers supernatural change. He's promised it to us. Now, we've heard a lot about predestination, etc., and it does talk in the Word about being predestined, but we're predestined for change. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And that's supernatural, and we need God's help for it. We struggle with change. Why? Why do we not like change? And so often I've heard people say, and I've said, God loves me just the way I am. That's 100% true. But he loves you so much, he doesn't want to leave you the way you are. And that's so wonderful to me. He doesn't want to leave me the way I am. We change. God does not. Let's look at Hebrews 13, 18. Hebrews, pray for us, for we trust we have... Really? Hebrews 13, 18. That's what it says? 13, 18? Well, you know what? I, wrote, I typed in the wrong scripture. Try Hebrews 1, 12. That'll say the same thing. 13, 8. All right. There we go. Would help them. Maybe I should start using my Bible and not just depend on the notes I write to them. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is always the same. He changes not. And Hebrews 12, tell, uh, 1, 12 tells us the same thing. He is the same. He does not change. So if there's going to be a change, who needs to change? We do. Because he's not going to. He has set certain things in motion, and he's not going to change. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. He is number one. He is the creator of the universe. So his character, his nature, his love, his holiness, his long-suffering, all the attributes of love, all the fruit of the Spirit, he does not change. Zero change in that. That should make us rejoice. That's good news. He never changes. But let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12, because I've had people come and people have said that, that the scriptures contradict themselves. It says God never changes, but he does change. Now, I just told you the areas he never changes, love, etc. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So death passed on to all men. Next verse. For until the law was in the world, sin was not imputed where there is no law. So how God deals with us has changed. He hasn't. But how he deals with us has changed. So from Genesis to Moses, when the law came, sin was not imputed. Jesus paid for those sins. And for instance, Abraham was in that. Noah was in that group. There's all these other various people, Enoch, all these people, Methuselah, that believed God 
and they were, it was accounted to them for righteousness. So yes, when Jesus, after he rose, they will be saved. But sin was not imputed to them. They didn't have to pay for it. So God dealt with from Genesis to the law or Moses differently. He hasn't changed. But though his dealing with us is different. And this is important. So let's see the next verse. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? Next verse. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is why one man, one man, Jesus, no other way to get to the Father but by Jesus hath abounded unto many. So, how did God deal with us? From Genesis to Moses, the law. Sin was not imputed. The law came. So from the law to the death, burial, and resurrection, sin was imputed. And God said, you do this, and I'll do that. Now, from the resurrection on until the return of Jesus, by grace. He's dealing with us differently. We have a new covenant. And we have to remember, God didn't change, but the way he dealt with us. Remember, he wanted those, that first group of Jews to go into the promised land. They rebelled. They murmured. They accused God of wanting them to die in the wilderness. And it's interesting. God didn't say, okay, I'm going to kill you all. He said, and that same law is in place today, as we heard Pastor David say. He said, according to your words, as you have spoken in my ears, so be it unto you. You will die in the wilderness, as you have said. But the next group, the next generation, went into the promised land. Those people decided they, the first group didn't want to. But God's plan for them to go to promise to Abraham was still there. We often try and pull one or the other into our life. Sin not imputed, and so we look at that. Well, Cain killed Abel, and then Lamech said this and that, and we go on. Well, now we're, some people are saying, oh, Jesus died for my sin. I'm under grace. Sin's not imputed to me. Well, that's true under grace. But always, always remember, sin has a price. And who you obey, you will be a slave to. And we've seen what's happening in the world today. People that become slaves to Satan, what happens to them? So if we sin, we have now opened the door to Satan. Then there's still a group of people, and really religion hammers on this, where they want us under the law. God won't do anything for us until we do this. We have to confess the word, confess the word, confess the word, or God won't heal us. We have to confess the word, confess the word, or God won't bless us. And yet it's very clear that we're redeemed from the curse and blessed by Jesus. So we, we're trying to mix all of these up, and it depends what our propensity is. If we're really like this, and we need a list, and we're very organized, we will check off all our boxes. I did this and sit back and say, God, how come you didn't show up? And end up getting really ticked off with God. People get ticked off with God. They get angry with God. They turn on God. They accuse God falsely because we don't understand which dispensation we're working under. As a result, our character has to change. We have to change from this works-oriented idea. If I don't do this and this, God won't bless me. Well, the thing is, there is Satan is in the world. But let's remember one thing. God never changes, and he gave man dominion and authority and he has never taken it back. He has never taken it back. You and I 
are walking in authority and dominion. Jesus got it. Adam sold it out to Satan. Jesus got it back. He says, now you go. We're operating in that authority under the authority of Jesus. If we don't realize that we are under the authority of Jesus, we will start looking at ourselves, and we will have a problem thinking, I did all these things, now it's all okay. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. We're talking about change. People don't like change often. There's reasons for that. We're going to look at that. But to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. There are seasons. God said there's seed time and harvest. And there's four seasons. Summer, snow, winter, fall. There is a season. There's seasons in our life. And a time when we have to let go of certain things. But after the new birth... God desires us to change, and it must be constant. And that constant change, as I read, said at the beginning, is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And that requires constant change. Because as long as we're in this earth, we will constantly be needing to change into the image of Jesus. Is there anyone here that's completely, totally walking every minute of every day in the image of Jesus? then we have to continue to change. That's what we're predestined for. And it's our choice. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. We're praying in other tongues. And we don't know how to pray as we ought. And so we pray in the spirit. But we have to be called according to his purpose. And I believe his purpose in here, he wants relationship with us. We saw that at the beginning of the year. But his purpose is for us, he's predestined us, purpose to be conformed into the image of his dear son. God never uses evil. All things work together for good when we pray in other tongues. Praying in other tongues gives us revelation, knowledge, helps us to understand and to be conformed into the image of Jesus. But his purpose is fellowship. He wants a family. He wants us to fellowship. And he wants us, we've been predestined, to be conformed into his image. God loves us. And we say, I love God, I love God. But do we love him where, to the point we're willing to do what he says to do and lay some things down and be conformed into his image? I don't know. I mean, like, maybe none of you, maybe every time you saw you needed to change, it was just like that. But we have to be very careful that we're not into behavior modification. Because that's the natural man and the way the world operates. That's not the way God operates, and we'll see that. This is not behavior modification. There are things I thought, okay, I'm going to change the way I think. I'm going to just change this. I'm going to change this. And the same pressure comes, and wham, I do it over again. Remember we studied compromise? When there's just behavior modification, we can fall into compromise. And that's not what we're talking about here this morning. We're not talking about that. But to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to heal like Jesus, to do the works of Jesus requires change. And I don't know, sometimes, you know, you can try and try to change and it's not working and it's frustrating. And then you can get under guilt and condemnation. But that's not where it's at. God doesn't use guilt and condemnation to get a person to change. That's religion. God is committed to change in my, for change in my life. And he's committed himself to help me. Romans 12, 1 to 2, please. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove. When, when something is being proved, it's being demonstrated. You know, they test gold to see if it's really gold, or they test a diamond to prove it if it's real. You can prove what God's will is, and his will is to be predestined, fellowship and predestined into the image of his dear son. Change there, transformed, means metamorphosis. And we have to realize that it's from the inside out. We talk about metamorphosis, so we talk about a caterpillar to a butterfly. That caterpillar does not turn into a butterfly by, oh, I gotta change. Oh, I gotta change. Oh, where is whatever it is that's gonna make me change? He's waiting for the rain to come or for a whatever it might be, the king of the beasts to come to change me into a butterfly. It doesn't come from the outside family. It comes from the inside. It's what's inside that butter caterpillar. It's the butterfly on the inside that gets him to change. And it's what's on the inside of us that will cause us to change, not what's from the outside. And as I said, if it's from the outside, it's merely behavior modification and it's huge because then God's promised and he wants us and he's predestined it for us to be changed into the image of Jesus he's put that in motion that if we will cooperate with him he will help us he will give us what we need and he will give us the process by which we need to be changed into the image of Jesus family we don't have time to play games this thing is wrapping up, and there's souls out there that need to be touched. We have to be conformed into the image of Jesus. He said, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to my Father. We have got to do the works of Jesus. Never mind, I've heard people argue and discuss what the greater works are. Let's start doing the other works, laying hands on the sick, raising the dead, etc and then we can talk about the greater works we have to be conformed into that image culture i did talked about teaching our children culture 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 out there in the natural realm they're trying to squeeze us from the outside squeeze us into the image of that whatever's going on out there. The whole woke culture, the attack on the children, squeezing us, trying to bombard our mind to get us to conform to their image and what they think is right. And they're belittling Christians. And you hear people and you hear Christians, well, we just have to walk in love. And we hide our head in the sand or we quarantine ourselves, and we won't go out there and we hide behind our four walls thinking we're safe. But God is saying, family, I want you to be conformed into the image of my son. We have to be able to stand and oppose the spirit of this world. And we need to be renewed in our mind. We have to see it from God's perspective. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is comparing the old covenant, the law, to the new. The glory under the old to the glory of the new. The law showed man, showed people, showed you and me, how we couldn't keep it, how we were sinners, how we needed a savior. The purpose of the law was to show us we couldn't do it. Nobody other than Jesus has ever kept the whole law. He fulfilled the law. And the glory 
of the new covenant is in our spirits. We have this treasure, this glory in our um, earthen vessels, our bodies. It's in us. And I'm just summarizing 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, it talks about when Moses was up there, he needed a veil. Well, one, he needed a veil because the children of Israel didn't want to see it. They didn't even want to talk to God. They said, Moses, you just talk. Let, talk to God. We don't want to hear him. And then Moses had this veil because they were intimidated by it. They were fearful of the glory. But it also says that the glory on Moses' face faded away. Family, the glory that's in you will never fade away. It'll never fade away. It's in us. Hallelujah. But sometimes when we're serving God, we're talking about what God has to say, raising our children, healing the sick, makes people feel uncomfortable. And a lot of times it's the religious people that really feel uncomfortable. And they're usually the ones that will rise up and attack. Mind you, today there's a lot of attack on Christians and we need to be strong. But not in ourself, in the power of the Lord and in the power of his might. Don't cover up what's in you. Don't cover up the glory that God's put in you. Don't hide from it. Don't be ashamed of who you are and what Jesus has done for you. Don't be ashamed to say you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Don't be ashamed. We are always to reflect the glory. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians 3.17. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that's important. We have liberty. We have liberty, freedom. When you're born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have a freedom not to sin, it's not God's will that you sin. This idea, well, by grace I'm saved, I can sin, I'm already forgiven. No, God didn't send Jesus to keep you in sin. He brought Jesus to bring you out so you could have that abundant life. Not just when we get to heaven, but in this earth time that we're walking down here. Jesus paid a big price. He became a curse. So we don't have to sin. But sometimes we do. But we don't go under condemnation. What can we do? We can go boldly. Boldly. That's the liberty we have. They couldn't under the law go into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies, go into where the presence of God is. Well, I don't have to go where the presence of God is, you don't have to go where the presence of God is. The glory and the presence of God is in your spirit. It's in your spirit. Now I know there's the manifest presence in a group, corporate setting. I understand all that. But too often we're running around trying to find the presence of God. And I've heard teaching where, oh, you've got to get in this meeting because it's a portal of glory meeting and a portal in heaven's opened up and the glory's going to come out. There are no portals in heaven. We are under an open heaven. Amen. That's our liberty. We are under an open heaven. Glory to God. And the glory's in me and the glory's in you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Hallelujah. The other puts you in bondage. But we have liberty. Glory to God. 
So we're empowered in any situation to overcome. The thing is, when we miss it, when we sin, anything not of faith is sin. There's all kinds of things that are sin. Unbelief is sin. But when we do, and here's the big thing, admit it and repent. And don't blame somebody else for your behavior. And that's huge. That's something that people like to do. I don't know, maybe, you know, kids will do that. Well, I hit, you know, Timon would come along, well, I hit Brent because he did this. And Ty Brent goes, well, I did that because Timon did this. And Jody's just sitting there grinning because she did it all. And she caused all of it. But we like to blame other people. But that started in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And you will never change or ch have any power working in your life as long as you make excuses for your bad behavior. People have come to me and said, well, what I did was wrong, but you did this. You know what? There's no repentance there. You don't put the blame on somebody else for your bad behavior. You missed it. Repent. Change the way you think about it. And it doesn't matter. See, there's fear involved. What if they do it to me again? What if somebody else takes advantage of me? Look at what happened to Jesus. And he overcame them all. Jesus died for all our failures. But change, true change, will come by the Spirit of God. So now let's look at Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace with liberty. We can come not with our heads down, not ashamed, to the, that boldly to the throne of grace, the empowerment, God's willingness to use his power, the grace, the throne of favor, obtain mercy. Not receive condemnation. Not receive guilt. Not receive you lousy thing you. Not to receive Arlene. This is what, how often have you done the same thing? But I receive mercy. Mercy. Mercy for all my failures. And find grace, favor, his empowerment. To help me overcome those things that need change. When I'm willing to change. And he will show me what to do to change. That's the grace to help in time of need. That's when we come boldly to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. It's there for us. We will find comfort. Our soul will begin to prosper more than it did before. 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18 but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And it talks about in James, the glass is the word of God. The mirror is the word of God. We look into it, we see ourselves. When you read the Bible, you have to see yourself. When you see Jesus doing something, you have to see yourself raising the dead. You have to see yourself laying hands on the sick because he told us to do it. Are changed... But when are we changed? When we look into the word, in the glory of God. We're changed from the word. We're changed, what? Into the same image as Jesus. But it comes by the power of God, by the glory of God, by the spirit of the Lord, not by ourselves and our determination. we saw in Romans chapter 12 we saw that Proverbs 13 12 I'm going to look at that and some reasons why people struggle with change why they don't want to but hope deferred maketh the heart sick but when the desire comes it's a tree of life and this is big you, you know you want to change you want to change and you fail you want change and you fail. So you're hoping that things will get better and be different. 
and it doesn't. And it says, your heart is sick. But when we do it God's way, when we look into the perfect law of liberty, when we see him and allow the Holy Spirit to do the changing, our desire for change will come, and it's a tree of life. So, Romans 12, we'll look at Romans 12 again. But change comes, I said this before, from the inside out, by the word of God, not by modification, guilt, or condemnation, or manipulation. If anybody here uses any of those to get what they want, stop it by the power of God. You need help. That's a change that we need to all do. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Just stay here on one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now your bodies, the natural man, is controlled by the five physical senses. That's how we're tempted. So we're to present our five physical senses to the Lord. What we hear, taste. You say taste? Well, what we eat. It's all to be presented to the Lord. But notice, he's saying do this by the mercies of God. By God's goodness, he'll help you. Not by guilt and condemnation, but by his mercies. Present your body, your senses, a living sacrifice. Next verse. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed. Change to the way God thinks. And we get that by the word. Meditating the word, speaking the word, because the power of God is in the word. And when you speak God's word, you're releasing his power and his faith into a situation. Satan always uses human reasoning. And sometimes it sounds so good. And sometimes it sounds so good, but it makes our senses happy. And that's one telltale. I'm not saying God doesn't want our senses happy, our five physical senses happy. But Satan will make sure you feel, hmm, I'm good enough, yeah. I really don't have to work on this. I got it nailed. And that's probably the exact thing we have to work on most. Supernatural change, transform, metamorphosis. Supernatural, radical change, and that's God's way of changing. And we need him, but he's put that in our spirit. It's already in us, in our spirit man. You see, we don't like that. We don't want to commit our senses to God. Sometimes we don't want the way we think changed. Another reason we don't want change often is because we're unwilling to leave the familiar and the status quo. I don't want to step into unfamiliar ground. But that's where trusting God comes in. That's where change happens. Unfamiliar ground. The status quo. We all like to have, be part of the status quo. Whoa. And that's a problem. We all want to be accepted but we already are accepted in the beloved, and that should be good enough, and not to work and strive and be unwilling to change to be accepted by that out there. John 12, 24. You see, we're creatures of comfort. We want to be comforted. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. We don't like death. We don't like loss. And we think if I change this, what am I going to lose? But except 
the seed goes in the ground, you're not going to get fruit. You're not going to get change. And we don't like that. It's uncomfortable. It can be fearful. So we resist the loss. John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Unless the seed goes in the ground and dies to self, to change and changing some things that we're doing, putting them aside. But if that seed doesn't fall in the ground, we will not. If we close ourselves off to God changing us, we will not bear fruit. Because fruit only comes after a seed is planted. And that can be, you know, in the world's vernacular, scary. It's like, what am I going to lose? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my, my career, my this, my that? But if we want to bear much fruit, it requires change. It requires change. The high call of God predestined is to be changed into the image of Jesus. And it's a life of sacrifice. When you get married, there's a sacrifice. I mean, at work, there's a sacrifice. But when you get married, there's a sacrifice. If you're not willing to sacrifice your life, lay down your life for your spouse, you've got a problem. I've got a problem. When you have children, then you've got the one sacrifice, and having children is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. But when you lay that down and change to realize now I'm a parent, I put those things aside, the fruit that abounds is amazing. Amen. Grandchildren are marvelous. <laughs> you see, now your children make the sacrifice for your grandchildren. And we just walk in the fruit of that. a sacrifice living the Christian life is a sacrifice now we're not sacrificing ourselves to get God to do something but we do lay down our own desires when we do that God changes us and we have much more than we ever started with because that seed has been planted it dies and it will bear much fruit we've got to realize everything has a shelf life and we know that when you get married, certain things have a shelf life. When you have children, other things have a shelf life. Sometimes hobbies have a shelf life. And God's going to say, change that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. There's relationships that might be there for a season. And God's saying, that's it. Put it aside. Oh, you've got to be kidding. If I put this relationship aside, what if I don't have another relationship? What if they get upset with me? What if they gossip about me? What am I going to do about it? Obey God. Because not relationships can have a shelf life. And I, we can look at our life, various people that were in our life for a season. And when you look back, it was a good thing that it was only for that season. But at the time... It didn't feel pleasant. It didn't feel pleasant. And another reason, and this one's big, fear of change is fear of failure. What if I step out trusting God to change and I fail? And that's big because none of us like failure. It hurts but you see, God doesn't look at us as failures. And we're never to look at ourselves as a failure. The only time you failed is when you refuse to get up and continue doing what God's told you to do. Hallelujah. Please stand.